It is a pleasure to have today an old friend, uh, Deborah Rutter. Deborah, um, of course, is the president of the uh, Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. And um, in that capacity, let's see, I think you're the third, you're the third director, actually, uh, president? Officially the third, but officially third. there was another person who was in there. Yeah. So. Okay, okay. Fourth person doing this job. But we don't talk about that? Is yeah, that? Yeah, <laughs> he just had a different title. Right. Titles, who knows? Who um, but the first, the first female president. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and prior to that, of course, uh, you, and, and you started in the position on September, in September 2014, and prior to that, uh, president of the Chicago Symphony for about 10 years, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, where you were responsible for the appointment of Ricardo Muti, uh, of Yo-Yo Ma as the first Judson and Joyce Green creative consultant. And then I think you also established the Institute for Learning access and training. Uh, prior to her tenure in Chicago, um, Deborah was the president and CEO of the Seattle Symphony, where she oversaw the uh, building of Benaroya Hall. It's a wonderful hall. Uh, so a long and, and, and very, very distinguished career in our business, um, also very involved with the League of American Orchestras. We sat in many, many meetings together. So we're also two refugees from the orchestra business. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but it really is—it really is great to have you here. And, Thank you. And uh, Happy I, to be here. what I'd like—I mean, we'll work our way around to talking about um, a, a broader discussion about arts and, and training young artists. But, but I want to start with you know your your new job and and ask you to talk a little bit about what your what your ideas are for the Kennedy Center as mm -hmm. you think about the future. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for welcoming me. I this is my first time to Peabody. But it is um, a, an institution I have long admired and talked about because in our field, um, well, no matter what part of the field um, you uh, ha are active in, we think about where do the great musicians and great artists come from. And um, this is certainly one of the most preeminent. So thank mm -hmm. you for welcoming me here. Um, I actually uh, grew up playing the violin. I was uh, not was quite different from any of you in this room, in that I knew I was never going to be good enough to go to an, uh, a conservatory, but I really knew that I wanted to live my life in music and the arts. It was the one thing as a young person that gave me a sense of identity. Um, it gave me a reason to get up every day. It was the thing that was really motivating me. And I can say that with assurance now, although I don't know that I understood it quite that way at the time. It just was the thing I really wanted to do. And it was my North Star, guided me in every decision that I took in my life. Um, and so I really spent uh, 36 years in the orchestra business professionally and uh, was very lucky to have started out in my hometown of Los Angeles, working with two orchestras there. What I found by being in the operations world and then in, as an executive was that the concerts themselves were what made me happy every day and what the miracle was, was seeing people who came to the concerts and enjoyed them as well. I always felt like, you know, hooray, they're here, they <laughs> like it too, but um, what, became sort of the primary motivator for me was understanding that my experience around having access to the arts and being able to participate in the arts was something that helped me find out who I was. And that, that clearly is not totally unique. There are lots and lots of performers, actors, dancers, thinkers, whatever, composers, um, who have come uh, through their lives in the same way. Um, and so it really became important to me to support education activities and be an advocate for putting arts back into the school day because it was about when I was in high school that um, Ronald Reagan at that time, the governor, believe it or not, of California, cut out funding and that's when funding for school arts programmings went away. So it's been a really, really, really long time and I think you can push all of the troubles about arts funding and who are, are, what kind of opportunities kids have to that time that day. So we're talking the 70s. So we're talking 
45 years ago. We have missed generations and generations of people having the opportunity to learn music, art, dance, theater, poetry in the school day. Poetry to some degree with English classes, but by and large, kids have lost that opportunity. So I spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to put on the stage and how to develop pro uh, professionals and how to nurture the art form and all of that. But my overriding belief is we need every single person in America, because I can't deal with the rest of the world, but I need every person in America to have the opportunity to have art in their day. They don't have to be a fantastic oboist. They don't have to be a ballerina. They don't have to be a fantastic uh, theater person. But if you don't want to do it yourself, you can have the opportunity to appreciate it. And so I came to the Kennedy Center um, because I felt like this was going to be the platform that I could have the greatest possibility in having that influence. God knows if I'll be able to do it, but give me a microphone and I'll talk about it. <laughs> so, so um, let me ask the, the question with the context of some of the other visitors we've had in the symposium. I was mentioned to you earlier that we had, um, so Claire Chase was here, mm -hmm. Claire was here. And uh, we had the, the guys who co-founded co um, Le Poisson Rouge talking about that experience and what that meant. And so, so my question for you is, is um, you obviously, this, this, is, this is a very different kind of operation. This was the, the Chicago Symphony. Mm -hmm. Talking about two very established, main, in some sense, mainstream, large, large beacon kinds of organizations. And so I guess my question is, is I know what the role of some of those upstart organizations is in finding new ways. What is what is the role, what do you think is the role in a major institution like the Kennedy Center in finding new pathways mm -hmm. um, for the kind of thing you're talking about? Mm -hmm. So the way we think about it and talk about audiences and how we think about programming at the Kennedy Center is um, uh, we, we take the opportunity to ha be the national cultural center in the nation's capital to say, what's the biggest dream that you could possibly have? And for us, it's around all arts for all people of all ages, which therefore means that you have to really think hard about what that means. It, it is not just, oh, yes, over here we have our young people's concerts, or over here we have... Um, matinees for the senior citizens, but what does it mean to be thinking about all people, all ages, um, and in some cases all the time because we have such a huge facility. And it does give, but we do have a fair bit of flexibility. And so as a result, we can say, hey, let's have a composer in residence. I didn't have to ask anybody. I just called him up and I said, hey, Mason, come on down. We'd love to have you, which was really fascinating. You will understand because I didn't have to ask my music director what he thought. <laughs> like, yay. Sorry. Is there any music director in the room? But the idea was, who's the person who's going to have the best impact? How is he going to talk to my staff? How is he going to have an impact in our region? What kind of programming can he bring? And so um, we, he, uh, we appointed Mason Bates to come in. Nobody quite knew what to do with him, but we found the right individual within the organization who knew how to work all of the different parts of the organization and how to get things done. And what he has said now, three quarters of the way through his first season um, and about a year into his appointment, is this is a fantastic place to work because... There are no rules that I have to break. This is just creating something. Mm -hmm. There is a space. Let's find some creative stage directors or lighters or ask different musicians to come and do work. And because the center um, it, it has those resources and access to those resources, we're able to pull them in. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, it's been easier for me mm -hmm. to do new things mm -hmm than in other places. And for instance, um, we just appointed uh, Q-Tip as the first director of hip hop culture at the Kennedy Center. And um, we decided to do it without any preconceived notion of what, how large, what venue, and in the case of hip hop, how much of it would be music or dance or visual art. 
And um, because of the center's um, vast capacity, we sort of aren't worried. You know, we have about four or five programs, and most of them at this point are small. But we also know that if we decide that we want to do a big name hip hop um, rap singer, performer, um, we would be able to pull it off relatively easy. So that's the really good side of being a large institution, is that you have, if you decide, OK, in three months, we're going to go do this, you can pull the resources and aim in that direction. And then they'll go back to whatever their other job was. Mm -hmm. When you're in an orchestra, sometimes it's hard to make that shift as yeah. quickly. Yeah. And sometimes it's also really hard to say, well, why in the world would you have a hip hop artist as a part of the Chicago Symphony Orchestra family, right? You know, that doesn't make sense. In fact, it was because a hip, uh, a rap artist, several rap artists had been working with the National Symphony Orchestra that we really realized that there was a connection that we could make at the center. And it wasn't as uh, an artist standing alone doing his or her work over here, but rather integrating it with the other uh, art forms that we have at the center. So I mean, this goes to the, I think, one of the really interesting questions also about, about programming and, and the delineation between popular culture and, and so-called art music. Right. And, and I mean, my own view is that that's killed so many things right. you know, over the years. Right. And, and how, do we, how do we, I mean, it's certainly something we're talking about here. We're talking about contemporary music, right. how to make music of our time significant and a part of the whole institution. Right. Whatever kind of music Right, it is. and so this is the benefit, again, of the Kennedy Center, because you don't have to have the argument in exactly that same way. You can do some tests. Yeah. And um, uh, for instance, in the next three weeks, we're going to have two programs that absolutely blurs the line between, you know, is this a program of, quote, art music, or is it a program of contemporary music? And what is contemporary music? Contemporary music as we are speaking would mean one thing, mm -hmm. and a contemporary music to a, a non-musical audience, but who like music might mean, mean something altogether. Mm -hmm. I really believe that increasingly, as we look into the future, these are going to be blurred lines, that we are not going to have sharp delineation between what you would consider an art music program and something else, whatever that word might be. And so the program that we've created for the NSO called Declassified is blurring the lines and bringing different kinds of music together in the same program. It is made up of program repertoire that takes place in the subscription week. And then we might add another piece in. Shorten the program. We're changing the feel and the look of the, uh, of the space. So Mason is having a big role in that mm -hmm. in terms of the timing, the pacing, the presentation. But I think if we try to hold on, like, our, like it's a life raft, to the format and structure of concert hall experience of you know, the early part of the last century or, the, you know, or even earlier, then we will watch the audiences decline at an even sharper rate than they already are. So, so that's a really good segue to talk a little bit about how we train future musicians for mm -hmm. that because and it's something that we're you know I mean it is we're talking about this all the time and here and we're we're redirecting we will be redirecting things in our curriculum around this in our ensemble program and so I, I guess what I want to ask you is is that you know people that go to a conservatory tend to be you know very singularly focused on learning an instrument and as you well know it it takes everything you, you know it can take to get to get proficient and get outstanding at something. And yet, as I always say, everything around that has changed. Mm -hmm. So how do you, how do you, if you're talking to, you have a chance to talk to, you know, future, the people that are gonna end up in your, in the Kennedy Center, in mm -hmm. one form or another, some of them. How, you know, w what advice do you have in terms of what they ought to be thinking about? The most fundamental, I think, is that if you play the violin, you need to make sure that you have a friend who is a composer or a videographer or a dancer or a pop singer, popular music singer, sorry, 
but do not just talk to the same kind of art because you will only, it's like eating only broccoli for every single meal. You will be a very boring person and you will never do anything else. The, all of the really interesting artists now have friends who do everything else and that's not even now. Think about it. Yeah. The great music of, of Stravinsky was because he had all of these other friends who were artists and dancers, choreographers, costume designers, theater people. And it wasn't that he was hanging out with other composers. Right. So it is about broadening your palette and understanding what's going on in the wide, big wide world. Mm -hmm. And don't just do one thing. Do it really well. You have to become great at what you do because when you're going to want to collaborate with somebody else, they're going to be really great at what they do and you need to be, be the best at your game, but you need to know what else is going on. Mason Bates was working very closely with Anna Klein uh, as a co-composer in residence at the Chicago Symphony and she brought to him a passion for working with videographers. Mm -hmm. And it was that work that he did with her that encouraged him to throw out the program book and start providing sort of electronic digital version of the program book. Mm -hmm. And then from that, thinking about what should the experience, the physical experience in the room be? Mm -hmm. And then maybe I should get up out of my chair and I should be moving around and having a different experience. So it really is about talking to other people, understanding what their experiences are and growing and being open to it. If you only can become an expert in the one area, you're going to be limited over time. I want to tell a story, and I'm going to be careful about the subject of the story, but I went to a performance that we created um, as a part of a new series at the Kennedy Center with a, a very highly respected professor of music um, who has gotten kind of tired of going to concerts. And is that because it's got to be the very best, so it can only be X, Y, and Z orchestra or performer? but kind of tired of going to concerts. And um, this person went with me to hear a, a program that we at the Kennedy Center called Demo. It's hosted by Damian Wetzel, who's a retired principal dancer of the New York City Ballet. And the program consists of him bringing basically people he loves, admires, and wants to collaborate with. And they create a show on a particular topic, whatever that topic might be. And the show in this case was called Time, and it was about what kind of references there are to time throughout the performing arts. We had an actor, we had a, um, a videographer, we had a dancer, and we had a comedian working with a ballerina. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the 90 minutes, I was kind of nervous taking this person along, and at the end of the 90 minutes he said, that's the best show I have seen in years. Now this is a very highly established professor of classical music instrument who was thrilled to have his brain stimulated by great artists coming together and creating something completely new and different. So that's what I mean. That's what I think is, it, it, we're not going to give up a concert with a Mozart symphony and a Bruckner symphony. We're just not going to give it up. But we're not going to be able to sell 52 weeks of it either. Because you, all of you people who are following us in generations of being passionate about art, have much more diverse interests. Yeah. And we need to offer that. And if we cling to something just because we think it's precious, it will get smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. That's my belief. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's, you know, I think the challenge for, for folks here, and actually for our faculty as well, and I'm very, I always, you know, it's, it's I, I speak honestly about this, is to say that, you know, a lot of people here were, were particularly faculty, were, you know, came up in Absolutely. where that's what you did. And it's hard to imagine that that doesn't necessarily work anymore. Right. And, it, and, it's, and it's... And it's not because it's not good. Right. It's actually generational. So we have to pay attention to it being generational. Mm -hmm. It's not that it's not good. It's just that eating habits change, lifestyle habits change, everything changes. And there was a very long period of time where this didn't change, but we're at such a dynamic, rapid uh, growth spurt, change uh, time, that 
we have to acknowledge it, we have to embrace it, we have to encourage it, because holding it back will actually be more detrimental than exploring what the possibility is. Right. I mean, one of the things I think is that it really is, is I think it's a really scary path if you're not willing to do that because it's because it's so limited actually and, mm -hmm. and, and dependent on certain things remaining the same. If you're willing to do that, if you're willing to take to you know to become optimally flexible and think openly about about how you approach your art and audiences, you 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 all of a sudden so much more becomes possible. Right. That's exactly right. I also think that um, there are very few places where you can only do one thing and do it well as a specialist. Mm -hmm. And there are so many more opportunities. And I, I imagine that as you um, leave the conservatory and think about what your next possibility will be, um, a lot of it will, you'll have to be an entrepreneur because you'll have to be selling yourself in one form or another. And um, whether you're a freelance musician for a period of time or whether you become a famous opera singer, you have to be flexible, responsive, and go to where the work is interesting and where you're called and how you might create it for yourself as well. So if you could design a curriculum, what would it look like? Ah, uh, yeah, that's your job. That's, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's you guys can do that. <laughs> but I, I, I think that um, there is always going to be the sort of push and pull of becoming so great at what your art form and technically become virtuosic in whatever that, that specialty is, but then transferring it to let go and release and explore. And life is going to be a whole lot more interesting with that. And so it's really about um, developing that. And, and I honestly believe that we need the young people who are coming out of conservatory now with that attitude to go out and train more like that as well. Because what we don't need is to sort of come in and say, but I only need to be a really great oboe player. There's nothing else I need to do. Because there will be too many oboe players in the world without enough work if you don't go out and actually figure out ways to create a living as an artist. Because the world needs more artists. It absolutely needs more artists and more people doing creative work. Um, it's just that it won't look exactly the way it has looked in the past. So I want to come back to Kennedy Center and also Chicago Symphony and, and ask you the question in terms of the Kennedy Center. Uh, you talked about sort of the national, and, and that's, the ob that's obvious. What, how do you balance, or do you, that with the local, with sort oh. of the, 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 the role in Washington, mm -hmm. politics aside? I mean, the actual role in the community. Yeah. I think actually, um, in in many ways, we've sort of thought of ourselves as national as it came to what was related to education, and then really only local, because we really are the performing arts center for the region, and we think of DMV as as a our audience. Um, I believe that because of the mandate of being the national cultural center, we do have a responsibility to be a role model. But I'm not thinking that we're creating programs that are going out into the world. Mm -hmm. I think that lots of art can and should be happening locally. But I'd love to be a role model. I'd love to convene meetings. I'd love to have conversations. So thank you for this conversation about this. Um, and uh, so I really think about the programming that we offer as being for our um, community, mm -hmm. our larger community. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting having. Um, worked really only in orchestras for all of my career, to then have all of the art forms yeah. has been so fun, so exciting. Um, and we don't really want to uh, be so big that we keep others from being successful. And I think we try to be a really good partner and colleague to the other organizations in our community. But we do also recognize that if we don't bring some theater or an opera, then that might not have an opportunity in our community. So we do think hard about uh, being a, a, a resident performing arts organization. So one of the things, I mean, we're talking a lot here and thinking a lot about, about our collaborations and partnerships and our community collaborations. And I, what I want to ask you is, 
So you t and you you talked a little bit about it with 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 Mason's role. Um, mm -hmm. Talk a little bit more about how you envision because you do have an, an amazing place with constituent companies companies coming in and out. How do you create more cross disciplinary? How, how do you how do you get people out of their slots yeah. and working across the organization? Well. Um, I tell them that they're not going to do well on their performance measures <laughs> if they don't talk to each other. No, I, don't. I mean, it, that, notice the silence in re reaction to that. Basically, we set up structures where people have the responsibility of talking to one another, telling each other about what the programming is. And in that conversation, there is a, sort of that aha moment that if we both work on this project at the same time, we will leverage the funding and we will have a larger impact. Mm -hmm. And so um, by creating one larger artistic department as opposed to a whole series of individuals thinking separately about their art form and then sort of arm wrestling for dates in the venue or mm -hmm. attention from the marketing department or funding, um, by working all together, they actually have come to discover that one plus one plus one plus one plus one, plus one equals a lot more than the individual mm -hmm. coming together. And so um, we are uh, about to start celebrating the centennial of John F. Kennedy's birth. Oh, yeah. He was born in um, 1917 in May. And we've decided that this is a, a really perfect opportunity for us to sort of reposition the Kennedy Center, remind people that it is the memorial to John F. Kennedy. And, to, and why? Why was a performing arts center named after a president? And it's something that some people kind of have a good idea but don't really know. And, and this is a, so it's a prime time for us to um, reaffirm our position, but also to talk about why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. And the fact that JFK spoke so beautifully about the arts and humanities, and there are so many magnific magnificent quotes that he has offered about the role of the artist in society, mm -hmm. and then his role in advocating for uh, service, justice, freedom. These are all ideals that we can build programming around. Mm -hmm. And so we have spent a huge amount of time with the people responsible for, for creating programs, producing programs, and said, OK, we're not celebrating the Leonard Bernstein centenary, which is the year after. Mm -hmm. We're not doing the centenary in, you know, we're not going to be able to perform music of somebody, some famous composer whose anniversary you might celebrate. We're doing it for a president. So that means you have to really think hard about why you're programming and how it connects. And it has come, it has been, reaped amazing rewards, a commitment to the place that we all have in a much more intense way. And you suddenly say, oh, wait a minute. This is the year we should program this. This is the year we can program that. Um, and it has helped us think about rebranding the Kennedy Center. So it's been the motivation behind all of this. And what's great is, um, yes, it's going to be really fun and easy to program the Bernstein Centenary the following year. And every art form gets to be involved with that. But this one has really forced people to think and work harder and more productively together. And so they're coming together. It's something. I've only been there the same amount of time that you've been here. So you, it all takes a little bit of time to do, but it's pretty exciting work. You can do mass? We're not going to do mass because mass was written for the opening okay. of uh, the Kennedy Center. So we're saving that for our 50th anniversary, ah. which is in 2021. Right. So sense. we'll save it for then. We'll do bits of it uh -huh. next year. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. But we'll save it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Well, so you know, I'd like to open it up and let folks ask okay. some questions, too, and then we can continue to chat. Um, questions for Deborah. I'm Samantha Fuker, and Samantha. I work with a bunch of different groups locally, including Occasional Symphony. I'm now their vice Good. president, so that's an exciting development. Good. But uh, one of the things we, a uh, bunch of the groups here, want to do is create a venue that gathers us all together. Um, so I guess, you know, based on your experience of sort of already coming into a venue that's huge and big and multidisciplinary, what would you say like, to somebody who wants to start that here? Um, as a collaboration mm -hmm. or as, as a, a place as to perform? As a place to be and perform and I bring think, people in. Yeah, I think first and foremost, you need to build the relationships between the people and the organizations. 
um, because it's really easy to say, oh yeah, what a good idea. Let's have a center where we can all come together and we'll trade. It's amazingly complicated to do that work. Um, but and, and immediately you can uncover all kinds of conflicts potentially. But, but the synergies, the positive synergies, are much greater. So the first thing to do is spend a lot of time hanging out together, talking about what priorities and why something needs to be um, created and how you would go about doing that. I think one of the exciting things that's happening in the absence of these formal structures of institutions like the Kennedy Center is the exciting sort of spontaneous nature of, if for lack of a better word, a pop-up experience. It's like the pop-up meals that can suddenly everybody's going to go to Charles Street and have dinner together in the street. That kind of experience is really interesting and exciting these days. But you have to, again, have a way, a mechanism, and, and that's really going to be about the relationships. There are good and bad things about um, a place like the Kennedy Center, because this morning I was listening to staff talking about creating another procedure for how we decide what office space. It's like, really? Oh my god, I can't believe we're going to have to have a committee deciding where office space. So there are bad things about being That paid. sounds familiar. <laughs> there are bad things. But the good thing is, all together, you can create something pretty special. So I'd start just by getting together and talking. And what is it you're really trying to achieve? Good luck. Another question for Deborah? Hi, I'm Daniel Subsgabai. Hi, Daniel. I'm a composer here. I'm a master's student. And um, I had just a couple questions uh, about a kind of a two-pronged thing. So how did the Mason-Bates collaboration come about? And was it a committee? I mean, I'm sure you were interested and you wanted to do it, but how did that get decided on? Yeah. So um, my very first uh, full-time job was at the LA Philharmonic. And within months of me starting there, I found myself responsible for the composer in residence. And so it, this is something that I have long held very near and dear um, as a personal value, which is that it's great to be an instrumentalist, as I was, and to make the music and be in an orchestra. I just love that. But we need, it, we need always to remember to um, nurture our composers. So I've always had, I've always worked with composers all, all my life. No matter, when I went to the LA Chamber Orchestra, we didn't have a composer in residence, so I created a composer in residence program. Um, and there are many different ways that this can happen. In my case, I came to the Kennedy Center and I said, oh my gosh, this place is 45 years old and it has never had a composer in residence. The NSO commissions music nicely. And um, the opera has, has an active world around con uh, contemporary opera, but there's never been a composer in residence. So I said, stay tuned. Hello. <laughs> and honestly, I um, wanted to do it quickly, and I wanted to do something with somebody that would make a statement about our world. And I remembered the conversation that we had with Ricardo Muti. And in his case, he was the final decision maker, but there were two or three people who were providing scores for review. And we had a couple of people reviewing those scores and took the ones that we felt were the strongest. And there were maybe 20 examples of composers of different sorts. He had really wanted Americans, so we'd focused on Americans, but all range. And he came back, and he he's the one who chose Anna and Mason. And the reason he did was, I want people who have something important to say, and I want people who can tell me what um, the people of a younger generation want to be listening to. And so that's why he t chose two such young people. In the case of Mason, hello, it's the first and last time I get to be a committee of one. And um, I, he's from Richmond, Virginia. He, the Kennedy Center felt like home for him. He had done, I had a lot of conversations. And over the years of being in Chicago, what he had done there was work that I knew that we needed to do. But, um, and I felt like he was going to be the strongest advocate. Um, he has a very strong so southern style that says, by God, I need it. Have this done this way. And it happened. 
Now, um, in the future, my guess is it won't happen exactly that way. And I think having a lot of input is really valuable. But you have to know why. We, you know, one needs to know why you're making such a decision. And in the case of Mason, I love his music. I love how he thinks. And I love how he influences others. And that was really important to me. Great. And so my second part of this question is, so you have this composer in residence program, and you have the uh, young artist program for opera singers. And mm -hmm. then there's also the visual artist program for artists with mm -hmm. disabilities. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you had any plans, because as a young artist, one thing I'm really interested in is opportunities like this. Do you, are there any sort of plans for um, young performers or outside of opera or young composers for any sort of opportunity? So we have a, a wide we have a wide range, and it's a part of the future education program um, that we have. There is a summer music institute. It's usually for slightly younger than the conservatory here. Um, and Mason and I have been talking about what we should be doing around young composers, and should we reinstitute the reading sessions that the National Symphony used to do, the conductor program that we used to be able to do as well. So we're looking at building some more of these back because it's a little haphazard. If you look at the landscape that you have so successfully figured out that we have, it's a little bit all over the place. But we're, we, too, are in the middle of a strategic planning process. And we're looking at the role that we play at nurturing talent as well. So stay tuned. It is so important. I mean, I'm one of the things that, that you know, I mentioned earlier, our interest in new music here, which is, which is not always the case of conservatories, as I know you know. And it is what was striking to me when I came to Peabody. We have a, it's a fabulous composition department. I mean, it's really, it's really first rate. And and yet the performance of new music was not as present as it mm -hmm. should be. And yep. so we've started a new new music ensemble and Good. hosted the new music gathering here Good. this year. And I think that we'll as we're thinking about as we're thinking about. You know, an appointment in our opera department. We're thinking. I'm looking at Ah, who's chairing our our mm -hmm. you know opera search. We're thinking about the new music piece of this. So I think it's it's a really important thing. Mm -hmm. It's a really important. So thing. do you know about the op uh, American Opera Initiative that we do? So there are two pieces to our opera program, mm -hmm. where we have a young composer work with a librettist and then is mentored by a senior um, composer, and they create a 20 minute opera. And we do three of them. And then depending on how that goes, you might be commissioned to do the one-hour opera. So within the WNO, you have that, that kind of program. I think that I, I uh, would be willing to be corrected, but one of the issues I was really concerned about was the fact that in Washington, DC, we don't have a very active contemporary music program. So to your point, mm -hmm. whereas in Chicago, it was absolutely an incredible mm -hmm. array of richness, maybe 15 new music ensembles. Mm -hmm. And it never meant that they were competing with one another. It meant everybody was rising up and doing better. Mm -hmm. So we've had a really good, successful reaction to Mason's programs thus far. Mm -hmm. But we want to do even more. And he's really thinking about them as being quite immersive experiences mm -hmm. and not just the traditional, you know, right. Stagecraft of walk out, perform, hope that you like it. If you didn't, goodbye, and then leave again. But a much more interactive, mm -hmm. unusual setting. Mm -hmm. So I'd love it if you'd all come and give us the feedback. You know, this is what I liked. This is what I didn't like. Too much of this, not enough of that. Mm -hmm. Because we're still experimenting, and we'd love to encourage more of it to happen. Because you're absolutely right. This is a part of. Yeah. It's another part of the creative life that's not really happening well, in our well, well, in our community. I, 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 I'm in. I tell the story too. I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that. I, and I got very involved in new music later in my career. But early on, when I I got all the way through my master's degree without playing any, and then I made up for it as a doctoral student where I played mm -hmm. a lot of contemporary music. But because of where I was, mm -hmm. there wasn't there wasn't this. It wasn't. It wasn't pushed, and I think mm -hmm. it's a. It's a huge. It's a huge mistake, and right. so we're trying to. That's great. We think. Congratulations. That. I want to talk a little bit. Let's come back because I mean we are. We are. We have been involved with orchestras, and I and I li I'd like to get your view. And obviously, you still are, but you're. But it's you're a little one step removed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what what is what is and we'll get to more questions. But how do you what do you what do you think about orchestras? What's going on with orchestras today? What's your viewpoint? Now that you've stepped back a little bit from it, um, and it's a little bit easier probably to be a little more right. 
you know, objective well, about um, it? Well, I talk about this. Um, I spend a lot of time talking about it. Uh, and this is where some of the idea about understanding what the other arts are has been really important to me. Um, we need more uh, musicians who are passionate about art, art broadly, not just symphonic music and symphonic music that you happen to like, but passionate about what it means to be an artist and in an artistic ensemble. And I really mean that. If orchestras are going to survive and thrive, it needs to do so from the inside out, not from those of us who aren't good enough violinists to be in orchestras to do this. It has to come from within the institution. And it has to be passionate. It hasn't been, OK, I won the job. Now I get to kick back. And yes, I'll practice. But otherwise, I'm going to pursue my other hobbies. And I've got the job. You go raise the money. You sell the tickets. And I'm going to show up and play my notes. It cannot work that way. Because if nothing else, the people in the audience can tell that that's your attitude. Mm -hmm. So it has to be, for them to be successful, they have to be really great from the inside out. So the greatest, most miraculous thing that has happened to me in 18 months is that on any given week, going to the symphony is one two-hour slot of my life. And mostly, I also see opera, dance, chamber music, jazz, unusual theater, theater for young audiences. And what it has done is that it has shown me that people love going to live performances. So all of this discussion about audiences don't want to go to performances, audiences are graying and they're going away, is bunk. But those two hours with the orchestra are competing with all the other live experiences in the world. And if you are on that stage and you're not taking personal responsibility for it being really exciting, the responsibility for the success of the orchestra in the long term is also your problem. It is a big issue. Now, Denise, she never has that. She's a really great artist. <laughs> She's like selling it all the time. But I mean this. In fact, I want to start a campaign with the members of the orchestra, not because the National Symphony is any different from the Chicago to the Seattle to the St. Louis to the New York Philharmonic. But if you don't go to other performances and you only know what it's like to stand on the stage, you will never know what it takes to keep that orchestra alive. Denise. Denise. Hi, I saw you. The appointment of uh, uh, Gian Andrea Noseda was yours. Uh, well, look, he wanted to come <laughs> to, he was very interested in having a music directorship in America. That was really great. And the orchestra um, was really excited, and he was somebody that they were, really had their eyes on. And um, most, I, the role I played on the search committee was to say, take as much time as is necessary and don't take too much time. <laughs> so if it's right there in front of you, don't keep looking. Because if you really love what's right in front of you, you can, it, it really is OK to do that. And so um, I think it was helpful that I'd worked with him and knew him perhaps a little bit more to add to you know, the, the fact that he was relatively new to some of the board members and the musicians knew him as well. But uh, it, it helped clearly, but I did not. I am absolutely against, in this case, being the person saying, you should do this. Um, because it's really, with the music director, it's, uh, it's about chemistry. Now, in this case, this guy is a really outgoing, extraordinary, but a fantastic musician. Exactly. And one of those great um, uh, conductors who knows the world of opera as well as the, the, the concert uh, world as well. And so it's a, we're very fortunate. Thanks, Denise. I was thrilled about it. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just wondering, I didn't get the opportunity to see the Appomattox, and I was just wondering how that was received. So one of the most exciting things about Appomattox was I did a speech to a group of people on the Tuesday after opening night. And one of the questions um, near the end was, well, now that Appomattox has been so successful and you've sold out, how come you haven't extended it? 
which is a wonderful thing for anybody to say. And I said, well, I'm glad that you said that. It actually isn't sold out, and we have about 20% of the rest of the house to sell. <laughs> but, um, you know, and the reason was actually about the number of performances and w where they could fit into the schedule. Um, for those of you who don't know, Appomattox is a work by Philip Glass, and he retooled it very significantly. And the first half of it was based on the Civil War, and the second half of it is based on the um, Civil Rights Act. And you have, a, you have two big anniversaries, 150 and 50. Um, so it was a really important work to do. Um, it is, uh, um, and one of the wonderful things is all of the singers um, in the first half reappear in the second half in other roles. So Solomon Howard, who's sort of the darling of the Young Artists uh, program of the Washington National Opera, was Frederick Douglass in the first half and then Martin Luther King in the second half. And um, Robert E. Lee, who turns into um, Richard Nixon, and you know, uh, not J, the LBJ, not Richard Nixon. Sorry. Oh my gosh, that was Richard uh, to LBJ. So the it's a it was a hugely successful um, experience for the Washington National Opera because they worked really hard at making the connection. Uh, on a human scale and the human story that had significance in the DC region. So we had um, done significant programs in community. We'd brought um, singers, gospel choirs into the center as a part of it. And so it was one of those great happenings that was a really important artistic statement, but then also a historical statement and a cultural one as well. And it was one of those times when we had the something that can only happen in Washington, where you have elected and appointed officials coming because of their curiosity and appreciation for the art and what it was doing and what it was saying. So thanks for asking. Also an alumni of Peabody, Philip. There, yeah. 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 Very talented. Really, really great, great experience. Yeah. Um, I, one of the things I wanted to ask you about is, and it's this is something that is a, I mean, historically is a topic of long discussion, and in, in certainly in the classical music world, and and it happens to be a topic of really significant discussion on university campuses today, which is the whole diversity question. And I, I had an opportunity, and you're probably aware that the the um, Mellon Foundation hosted a you know little get together mm -hmm. with yeah. orchestras right. and mm -hmm. yeah, yeah it, was, it was interesting. And so, what do you have to say about that from the perspective of where you are today, and and that seemingly I don't want to call it an intractable problem, but I, I will say this: the, you know they, they read at that forum a letter from 1991 that was written about the state of orchestras, and to a word, it would apply 25 years later. Mm -hmm. That's the sad thing about it. Yeah. Um, it has to be the job. Uh, it, a lot of it goes to my first statement about every child deserves an opportunity to discover themselves through the art. And um, one of the biggest issues is the invitation and then the generous hosting of all people so that they have the opportunities to, whether they're going to sing or play an instrument, and whatever instrument is, and to have those same opportunities. Um, so often, those were the opportunities that we had in public schools, and they don't exist. But even so, I learned how to play the violin at a, in public school, and then I remember very clearly the day that the teacher said to my parents, it's time for her to start taking private lessons. And my parents could give it to me. But how many parents would not be able to do that? Mm -hmm. And so there are just not enough opportunities for all people of all backgrounds to be able to become really proficient at their art. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know. It, it's about access. It's about access yeah. and support. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't have a diversity issue. Well, we might have a diversity issue in basketball. There are not enough short Jewish guys <laughs> playing basketball, <laughs> right? <laughs> So what is the difference? There isn't. 
And so there, there needs to be an opportunity for everybody to have access to the arts. And you go to Cuba, which I just did, one of the more painful trips of my life for a variety of reasons. But most importantly, what the learning that you come away with is that if you have access, anybody can be successful if they have the raw talent and the desire to be successful. I have never experienced so much joy and passion and truly great performances. Not good for them at that level, wonderful, moving, deeply moving performances. And for right or wrong, the Cuban government gives all kinds of arts training. You know, you, you don't like a lot of the stuff that goes on, but they are really well educated and they all have access to the arts and unbelievable art that's taking place of all sorts. I heard, um, uh, uh, we were happened to be there at the same time the president was there, don't ever go somewhere where the president is because you will not experience it the same way. And we were not there with him, it just coincided. And so a lot of our programming had to be moved or canceled because of his movements. But we heard um, a string orchestra and it was uh, so memorable. And they were not playing on great instruments and we actually brought down as gifts from us to that orchestra two clarinets, a flute, and a piccolo because mm. they needed instruments. Mm. But nice. I'm telling you what they did and how they did it. So the point is it's about access mm -hmm. and um, leadership and mentoring. And it's, it's critically important. So we're doing what we can in some ways. I'm actually reevaluating and developing a fellowship program for arts administrators because arts administrators are going to be the ones who can help develop the programs yeah. as well. Yeah. Very, Sorry for the long, no, but you gave me an opportunity to go back no, on my soapbox. No, that's good. That's important. Um, so you mentioned the president. So what's it like to be the president of the Kennedy Center in an election year? <laughs> well, first and foremost, um, hopefully nobody knows how I vote. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, make, I'd take really good care of that. Because sure. we, what is fascinating for me, and so I grew up in Southern California. I lived um, on the West Coast, then in Chicago, and then I came here. And I always thought, you know, this is, it's very far away. You don't have access. You don't, this is sort of untouchable. But it's really fascinating because, um, in fact, we have regular communications with the White House. You have regular communications with the State Department, the Department of Education. All of those are a part of your local community. Mm -hmm. And whether it's them coming to performances or whether we're working together on a project, um, you have a lot of interaction with them. And um, uh, so that's why it's really important. And I really care deeply about the, the philosophy for mm -hmm. arts um, and arts programming and arts education. Mm -hmm. Um, and no matter who is in the White House, um, and no matter who, and what those appointments are, we're going to work hard on it. Um, I don't think that we're unique, though, that a day doesn't, a conversation doesn't pass where you don't talk about what's happening. Sure. In the, and this is an interesting political year. Yes, it is. Other questions? Hi, my Hi. name is uh, Brian Tracy. I'm a master's student here. Um, you had just mentioned um, a fellowship program for arts administrators, and I actually wanted to ask you. Um, as a young person who has their eyes maybe on, you know, hopefully getting a job like yours mm -hmm. one day, what, would you, what kind of advice would you give to a young aspiring arts administrator? Mm -hmm. Like where to start, what kind of things to do with their beginning career? Um, I, th this is the same answer whether I've been here for any period of time or not. Go to an organization that you admire and figure out how to get in the door. And if that means you're going to be an intern for 10 or 12 weeks or a longer period of time, do it. Because that way you will learn the language, you will learn the rhythm, you will have an opportunity to get a sense of priorities and what works and what doesn't work. And that's really true in so many different kinds of circumstances. Um, and most institutions, whether they have formal internship programs or informal, have opportunities for people to come in and get a feel for it. I was. Uh, um, on Monday night, we did the NEA Jazz Masters from the Kennedy Center. And um, the young woman who was helping to manage the backstage area was a woman who came in as an intern, then a temp, 
and now she's the assistant to the senior vice president for artistic planning. Mm -hmm. And she basically puts herself forward to do anything that needs to be done at any time in any way, no restrictions. And she's had more opportunity for growth in the nine months that she's been there than anybody. So that's the attitude. You have to, working in this field is a life calling because this is not normal sort of hours or dedication, but um, it's a calling. It's the most exciting work I think you can do because it's happening right now in your way and look at all the people who are positively impacted. It's really rewarding, but you have to put yourself out and you have to put yourself into that place. So no matter where you go, you could go to the Kennedy Center and you could end up in Flint, Michigan. Or you can go in Flint, Michigan and end up at the Kennedy Center. It's putting yourself out, be willing to take risks, really investing of yourself. Uh-huh. Hi, I'm, I'm Lisa Green Sudek. I'm on the dance faculty here. Great. And um, I, when I was a teenager, the Kennedy Center was my home away from home. $7 standing room tickets to Thank see you. all the major dance companies of the world was Incredible later, um, as a volunteer with the International Rescue Committee, Great. I brought um, Thank you. 45 Hmong refugees to hear Aldo Ciccolini play Eric Satie, which uh, was incredible. See, that's but, right. Um, but Where else? talking about the access issue and the graying of the audience and the diversity issue, um, the politics of the economics of uh, access to the arts as performance. Um, is something that really weighs upon me, and I wish to hear what your thoughts are about that. Yeah, it weighs on me as well. Um, so in case you don't know, every day at 6 o'clock we have free programming. It varies wildly, and you can't say it's the first Monday and therefore it'll be classical music, and the first Tuesday and it'll be jazz. It just is whatever happens. But we do try and take advantage of, of opportunities, both traveling artists from around the world or... If Alvin Ailey is in residency, we always have one or two um, programs with them on uh, Millennium Stage. So that's always really important. And I've heard from quite a number of, of young professionals who've said, that's how I started, was by coming to Millennium Stage. So that's been really great. Um, I was particularly proud of a program that we had in Chicago, which was that any student could buy a ticket for $11 and there may be fewer for some performances than for others, just based on demand, but that there were ways in which everybody could have tickets. It's one of those issues that I have been told works really well at the Kennedy Center, but I haven't experienced it firsthand yet. So it's not just about the MyTix program and does it work and does it get as many tickets out there as possible. But um, does it really draw you in? So one of the things that is a big priority for us is our di digital presence and how we communicate with people and how easy it is to find what we have available and what the ticket pricing is. Because the ticket price should never really be a barrier. Um, it costs a lot of money to do a lot of different things. There was a big article in the Post yesterday about how much it costs to, do, to come to see the ring cycle. But, you know, by buy two tickets to hear the Rolling Stones, yes. and it's a lot more expensive than coming to see yeah, The Ring. Right. Buy, it's 17 hours worth of music, buy you know, eight concert tickets, it's still a pretty darn good deal. Um, but it does cost a lot of money to do some of these projects. So there is this constant push me, pull you of ticket pricing and availability and how much you have. Um, and so some of the programs that we're offering at different times of day um, in different kind of packages is in order to bring people to have an experience that they're more familiar with. Because it's a really about when you do really interesting programming, but nobody's heard of Aldo Ciccolini and why should they come now, mm -hmm. then that $40 seems like too much money, even though $40 is nothing compared to an evening in a jazz club. Um, by the time you paid for your ticket and all of the other ancillary things. But if you don't know what it is, it's, it feels like it's a risk. So the digital presence hopefully will help introduce people to what they'll be able to hear, give a relationship, and demonstrate how easy it is to participate so that they can come back. You know, it's interesting because the 
digital opera that you can go to your movie theater and see what's going on live at the Met has been both good and bad because hmm. you have a totally different experience with opera. Um, it's not like being in the, in the opera house, except that you're really having the opera right there in front of you. Mm -hmm. You paid a lot less for it. There are benefits that you don't experience that yeah, way, right. but the, you got to see opera. So it's been very interesting because I think it was intended to draw more people in to the opera, and it has, to the movie theater. Right. But I don't know that it has necessarily drawn more people into live opera performances. So this is the constant battle of the role of a digital presence. Does it replace or does it complement and encourage? A very long time ago, when I was in Seattle talking to people who were at the front end of websites and you know digital content, the lesson I was advised at that time was this should draw you to your live experience, not replace it. So how do we use digital branding and communication and, and content delivery to draw people to the live experience? Because there's nothing like the live experience. The other should be supplementing it in some way. So it's, it's, it is a conundrum that I have not yet solved, but it's something we think about all the so time. That, so my next question about your digital strategy then for Kennedy Center mm -hmm. is it, it would be to project the brand and draw people in, or, or given the national roles, is there something more there? It is, um, well, it, y yes. <laughs> um, I don't think anybody really understands what happens at the Kennedy Center. Even if you come and you perform on the stage and therefore you're resident for six weeks, you don't understand. Um, uh, and I didn't have the full scope of it, and I had studied it. I had been in the building over decades. I didn't understand the extent of the programming that we offer. So first and foremost, we need to tell our own story. What do we have? Because no matter what you like, even if it is the most obscure art, dance of art form, we probably have it. We may not have lots of it, but we have it. Mm -hmm. We did two nights of a Vietnamese dance performance art program. And somehow we found this Vietnamese community that came and overwhelmed us with love because we were able to offer something that deserved and was we were honored to present. We have that. Mm -hmm. But most people in the world don't know all of what we're doing. So first and foremost, we really want to tell the story of what we have mm -hmm. to offer at the Kennedy Center. Because the diversity of what we have in that building is far greater than anybody can give, will ever give us credit for. Mm -hmm. We who work there know it. Mm -hmm. But um, primarily people know us for the things that fill up so much more of the space. So first and foremost, to tell our own story, mm -hmm. to be a role model, to encourage and develop artists, and then to really sort of remind people the role of the artist in our world. Because it's, it's, it, we're sitting, Fred and I are sitting on the stage. You, the artists, are the ones who are central in our society. You're the ones who are reflecting what's going on in the world. You're the ones who have a perspective that others want to hear and interact with. And that is the story that I want our digital presence to somehow communicate. I grew up in Washington, D.C., was a student at the Duke Ellington School. The Kennedy Center at the time used to give tickets to the students to come and um, mm -hmm. uh, hear the dress rehearsals and come sit in rehearsals. I saw my first opera uh, at the Kennedy Center. And uh, in fact, I was a super at 12 years old in the Kennedy Center, Kennedy Center Summer Opera Theater. That's all our fault. Il Furioso. <laughs> yeah. Yay. And I was just wondering if any That's a notch like belt. that to Kennedy Center Summer Opera Theater. Yeah. Might be, uh, Summer Opera Theater is a great idea, and we still do all the opera look-ins, and we still have many of those programs, and it's really wonderful when we have the auditions for the supers, and you see these people lined up on the, you know, along the Hall of States and the Hall of Nations, ready to go in for their auditions. So we do a lot of those things. Those are stories that we would love to tell more of, and we just haven't been very good about telling that story. We are in the midst of an expansion of the center. Um, we are, for the first time in its 45-year uh, exp uh, experience uh, history, expanding to the south. And we are um, doubling the number of venues, although right now we have nine theaters. And they are, go from large of the concert hall and the opera house to 
the jazz club of about 150, the new nine are going to be much smaller. And the idea is that we can do work like that and that the summer would be a fantastic time to be able to bring young artists in. For instance, we have a really extensive, impressive musical theater, college musical theater program, national. Um, and it's really been led because there were a couple of guys who were really rabid about it and have done a fantastic job with it. But we need to build it up with the other art forms so that we have summer opera, that we can do more dance than we currently do. We only have one ballet program. Um, but that expansion is going to allow us to do that even more because of the size of the, the venues and how we can lead it. So I really believe participation is key. And whether or not participation leads you to be a professional with your success or a, an attendee like me, it doesn't matter. I want all of it. So I'm hoping that that will be a part of the future. The expansion comes online in uh, the summer of 2018. So it's really not very far away. Thank you. I'll call you. <laughs> Has it always been that uh, the, the Kennedy Center Honors, because I'm on that committee, uh, I, I originally thought that it was just for Americans. But it's, it's much broader than that, though, isn't it? So the question is about who actually is qualified to become uh, an honoree for the Kennedy Center Honors. And um, it has been. The, the criteria is about lifetime achievement for the arts in America, which would therefore presume that it sounds like it can only be Americans, but actually there are a lot of people who come to America. America is the great melting pot and have a heavy influence uh, in America. And we are thinking really hard about what does it mean to be the nation's cultural center and an American icon at the Kennedy Center. Does that mean you can only do American work? I don't think so. But it does mean that we need to reflect arts in America. And so um, there isn't a hard and fast sort of check to see what your passport is to be an honoree. But I think there, it certainly has been about how do you reflect and how do you serve the arts in America. Did I dodge that well enough? <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> Other questions? I just wondered what's been the biggest surprise for you coming from the orchestral world and now? Uh... You know, people ask me about what my biggest surprise is, and it's really, um, surprise is a funny word because you sort of expect that sort of I'm opening moment. But I think that what I, when I describe the fact that on any given day, night, week, there is so much happening. And I think the pleasure of seeing very diverse audiences of background, demographic, economic, racial, all of that coming to the center, it's not so much that it's a surprise, but it's an affirmation of something that I wanted to believe, thought was there, and absolutely is there. Um, to see the response to the unusual programming and people really being enthusiastic about it, um, those are all really affirming for me. And um, really understanding that my personal belief that the arts are important in every culture and certainly as a reflection of who we are as Americans absolutely is valid. And all you have to do is walk through the Kennedy Center to know and believe it. People talk about the graying of audiences. I don't really feel that so much. I know as a parent of a teenager that you're really stuck. Sometimes you just cannot go out because you're, you're doing the work of being a family. Um, and at a certain point, you have more time. But let me just say, there are a lot of people throughout all the age ranges attending performances of all sorts. And, um, that's been really affirming. Um, and that's the message I'd really love to share, um, you know, yeah. far and wide. Hi there. Uh, you actually just touched on my question. Um, I'm sure people love to point out, you know, you're the first president who's a woman um, of the Kennedy Center. And, you know, arts administration historically has been a very male dominated field. And I'm curious what your insights are, not just for administrators, but for musicians. Um, it's maybe easy in the conservatory point in life to not think about the differences between 
um, you know, yeah. genders necessarily, but um, you know, moving in life as you know, families grow and such. What insights do you have regarding how we can make the arts as a general sort of notion, but specifically, you know, music fields, arts administration? Right. How can we make that easier for um, women to achieve these, you know, successful positions? I think the the biggest challenge of the work we do in the arts field is that it doesn't fit into a box at a particular time of day so that you can do your other life around it. And I think increasingly that's true for any profession, but this is the one I know. And I know that anybody who has a family will always have this, male or female. And so it's uh, about trade-offs. It's about um, finding the ways that work for you and um, finding the right partners in life to help make sure that you can be satisfied in that. Um, there are many sacrifices that we make um, to work in this field because we work at night as well as during the day. Um, at, but the benefits to your family are also extraordinary because they get to live in this world as well. And so um, my daughter doesn't get to have his dinner with me as much as she might. But really, I'm not quite so sure if her mother was a doctor or a lawyer or had to travel all the time for business, might have had the same experience. So it's easy for me to blame it on the fact that I work at night. But really, working parents are, are often going to have that. So it is not just a female issue. There are ways in which we all work. And you have to know yourself and be honest with yourself. And you have to. Um, know what's really important and what the priority is. And if, if being at home every day at 6.30 is a priority, you're going to have to make other decisions for yourself. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about this often. I uh, have always chosen to live relatively near work so that I didn't have to spend a lot of time commuting, so that I could be either at work or at home and to figure out a way to maximize where I spent my time. But that was because that was really important to me. If it's more important to have a big house and to have a huge garden and uh, et cetera, my daughter doesn't know how to ride a bicycle because I lived in the city in Chicago and it's terrible to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. But I spent more time with her. So she'll eventually learn how to ride a bicycle, <laughs> I, I hope. But so those are, it's about, and that will be true whether you're a man or a woman uh, because of what it takes to, do, to, to achieve what you want to achieve. It is worth noting actually, uh, per your question, that, that when you look at the, when you look at the, the, the CEOs of, of the sort of top orchestras, there's a very high proportion of them that are probably about half are women. Yes, maybe. That's I'd true. Say today. Because we figured out, and more people are uh, understanding it, yeah. and different skills for different kinds of roles. Right. It's really great for you to be here, and I really encourage all of you, whether you're faculty or figuring out what you're going to do or still dedicating your life to perfecting, this is an incredible um, gift that we have to be in this field. And um, you're in a great place with a great leader to think about what it means. Um, I really believe this concept of the art forms sort of merging more and more with one another. We just did Lost in the Stars mm. by Kurt Weill. And it was on the opera season, but we sold it as musical theater as well. Um, but you could also call it just regular theater. Mm -hmm. Because there's, there, you, know, you have to be an actor, you have to be a singer. It's all about how it's presented. Um, and we this did the same thing with street scenes. Uh, exactly, and was, exactly. Yeah. And it's not just you know, him mm -hmm. and his writing, but that's going to happen throughout the, mm -hmm. the field. And so we should stop thinking about, well, I'm a, you know, a this, but I'm in the world of the arts, and what can we do mm -hmm. to make the world a better place by communicating t with one another, sharing ideas, thinking about the world's problems and how we can be understanding one another more by using the arts. One of the things that, that, that um, you know, I, I'm sure you, you had the same experience uh, in Chicago, but I always observed with our audience and orchestras how meaningful it was for audiences to have proximity to artists yeah. and to interact with yeah. them and mm -hmm. to, and to right. know, sort of know what's behind the magic Right. Of that. 
And that's what our expansion is about. So we have nine, uh, as I said, we have nine venues in the Kennedy Center now, and they range, and they all have the, here's the stage and there's the audience, mm -hmm. with the, the couple of them being a little bit more flexible, but all of the new space, all of the new space, one will be a little bit like this, but very intimate, mm -hmm. and then all of the rest of the space is flexible, fluid, mm -hmm. uh, chamber opera in the middle, yeah. um, uh, chamber music, they will all have windows so that audiences walking by can look in and see what's going on. So it's intended to provide that access yep. um, and the connection. Uh, you know, I think most of you are more interested in having people be curious about what you're doing and why. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, there is no reason why the door is either closed or open. Mm -hmm and I'd much rather have there be some greater transparency. So that's our goal yeah. with the expansion. It sounds like a great space. Yeah, we're very excited very, about it. Very, very cool. Thank you. Yeah. Any final thoughts? Well, this has been really great. Thank you. Thank Deborah, you, Fred. Great having really great you here. To, and great and you. Uh, continued good luck with everything you're doing. It's a fabulous Thank you. opportunity that you have yeah. there. It is. I really feel lucky. Yeah, it's Thank you, Awesome Fred. place. It's great to have you good. here. Yeah, it's good to be here. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.